Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our Kelly Appeal TV, where we talk about the topics relating to R. Kelly and the Chicago trial and the federal Brooklyn appeal. So I do have an update as of August 31st, 2022. Happy birthday to my beloved twins. You know, you guys are awesome. I love you both in spirit and in the physical. So I just wanted to send that shout out to my twins. They are the big three, three today. And to all those who are here at Kelly Nation, welcome and thank you so much for being a part of the program today. So August 31st, we are now, we've heard everything that the prosecution had to offer. And now we're going to move into the um Criminal Justice Department of All Eyes on Defense after the arguments in R. Kelly motions for acquittal is heard. So I'm going to go over that with you all and hopefully that can, you know, help you figure out your opinion towards the case. So here we go. Okay, here we go. Arguments R. Kelly motion for acquittal to be heard followed by defense case Thursday. In this courtroom sketch, the front of the courtroom is blocked off as a sexually graphic video clip is played for the jury during R. Kelly's trial in federal court August 19, 2022, in Chicago. Cheryl Cook, slash AP. The federal judge, R. E. Kelly's federal child pornography trial, is scheduled to take up requests by the disgraced Randy B. Starr and his two co-defendants to acquit them of all charges before the jury even gets the case. The motions for judgment of acquittal, filed at the conclusion of the prosecution's case on Tuesday, are routine in criminal trials and almost always denied. At the very least, they are meant to preserve issues for a possible appeal down the road. After U.S. District Judge Harry Lanenweber rules on the motions, all eyes will turn to the defendants, who are scheduled to begin presenting their cases on Thursday. The jury has so far heard mention of an eclectic hodgepodge of potential defense witnesses, including disgraced attorney Michael Avenatti, former Chicago Sun-Times music critic Jim Derogatis, and the former lead prosecutor on the case, Angel Kroll, who exchanged emails with the star witness that defense attorneys suggested were inappropriate. Lawyers for Kelly's former business manager, Daryl McDavid, promised in their opening statement to jurors that he will take the stand in his own defense. Kelly's attorneys, meanwhile, have been silent on whether the singer will testify, but it would seem to be extremely unlikely given the nature of the charges and the exposure to cross-examination. In her motion for acquittal filed Tuesday night, Kelly's attorney, Jennifer Bonjean, wrote that the government failed to present sufficient evidence showing the singer knowingly coerced his goddaughter into sexually illicit conduct for the purpose of producing child pornography. Bon Jean also argued there was no evidence that the graphic videotapes made by Kelly of him allegedly sexually assaulting the girl, who was 14 at the time, ever left the state of Illinois, which is one of the elements prosecutors must prove to sustain a conviction on the child pornography counts. In fact, it is undisputed that the tapes are copies made by someone, but the government could not establish where the tapes were copied or by whom, Bon Jean wrote. The government simply did not prove that the tapes were transported in interstate or foreign commerce. Regarding other counts of conspiracy and receipt of child pornography, Bon Jean said the evidence was lacking. She also brought up a crucial theory of the defense, that the effort by Kelly and his business manager, Daryl McDavid, to buy back a sex tape had nothing to do with underage girls, but instead involved Kelly's then-wife and another adult woman. The government's evidence, even in its best light, failed to show Kelly specifically sought to receive child pornography rather than any embarrassing sex tapes, such as a threesome video involving his ex-wife, the motion stated. McDavid's attorneys, Bo Brindley and Vadim Glossman, argued that the government's case had multiple fatal flaws, including statute of limitation issues and witnesses who were unreliable and had changed their stories multiple times over the years. Kelly, 55, is charged with 13 counts of production of child pornography, conspiracy to produce child pornography, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. 
McDavid and another former Kelly employee, Milton June Brown, are charged in an alleged scheme to buy back incriminating sex tapes that had been taken from Kelly's collection and hide years of alleged sexual abuse of underage girls. Prosecutors rested their case in chief on Tuesday after calling some 25 witnesses over 10 days of testimony, including four women who said that Kelly had sexually abused them when they were underage. A fifth alleged minor victim mentioned in the indictment was not called to testify for reasons that so far have not been explained. Afternoon briefing. The trial's first week focused on Jane, who identified herself as the girl being sexually abused by the then superstar in three separate videos from the 1990s. One of those videos became the subject of Kelly's 2008 Cook County trial, during which he was acquitted of child pornography charges because, prosecutors now allege, Kelly and his associates went to great lengths to keep Jane quiet and recover other incriminating footage. Witnesses last week largely focused on those efforts. Three people testified that Kelly's team paid them to bring him videos of his homemade child pornography while he was awaiting his Cook County trial. Defense attorneys, during lengthy cross-examinations, have challenged their stories as inconsistent and tried to paint them as unreliable extortionists. Jurors on Monday heard from two other women who testified about their sexual contact with Kelly while they were underage. Pauline said she had sexual contact with the disgraced singer dozens if not hundreds of times when she was underage, and Tracy, who testified using only her first name, told jurors in extensive detail about Kelly's sexual abuse and assault of her when she was 16. A fourth alleged victim, Mia, testified Tuesday that Kelly sexually abused her in a Minneapolis hotel room in 1996, when she was 15, and also later in his recording studio in Chicago. Jim Eisner at ChicagoTribune.com. So, there's a lot of information that was sent out today. And, you know, the acquittal. The request for the acquittal, I need you to know, is part, as they said, of the criminal justice process. Um, regarding the criminal procedure of Rule 29 motion in the criminal procedure, and this is 2021 edition, the motion for judgment of acquittal before a submission to the jury, after the government closes its evidence, and after the close of all the evidence, the court of the defendant's motion must enter a judgment of acquittal of any offense for which the evidence is insufficient to sustain a conviction. So Bonjean has done her motion part. All is well. The court may on its own consider whether the evidence is insufficient to sustain a conviction. And then that would go forward to the jury making their deliberations. And uh, if the court denies a motion for a judgment of acquittal at the close of a government's evidence, the defendant may offer evidence without having reserved the right to do so. So remember, before the motion was denied uh, regarding Robert having someone come in to testify for him and it was denied, this is the time that the reservations can come into play. So reserving a decision. The court may reserve decision on the motion, proceed with the trial where the motion is made before the close of all the evidence. So as long as they can put the motion out there before all the evidence is on the table, they have the right. They have that right to acquit. Submit the case to the jury and decide the motion either before the jury re returns a verdict or after it returns a verdict of guilty or is discharged without having returned a verdict. You know, there is a dischargeable jury return where they can't make the decision. If the court reserves decision, it must decide the motion on the basis of the evidence at the time the ruling was reserved. Now, after a jury verdict or discharge, one, time for a motion, a defendant may move for a judgment of acquittal or renew such a motion within 14 days after a guilty verdict or after the court discharges the jury, whichever is later. 
Number two, ruling on the motion. If the jury has returned a guilty verdict, the court may set aside the verdict and enter an acquittal. If the jury has failed to return a verdict, the court may enter a judgment of acquittal. And number three, no prior motion required. A defendant is not required to move for a judgment of acquittal before the court submits the case to the jury as a prerequisite for making such a motion after jury was discharged. And D, conditional ruling on a motion for a new trial. Number one, motion for a new trial. If the court enters a judgment of acquittal after a jury, a guilty verdict, the court must also conditionally determine whether any motion for a new trial should be granted if the judgment of acquittal is later vacated or reversed. The court must specify the reasons for that determination. What's your thought there? Number two, finality. The court's order conditionally granting a motion for a new trial does not affect the finality of the judgment of acquittal. And then, of course, appeal. A, grant of a motion for a new trial. If the court conditionally grants a motion for a new trial and an appellate court later reverses the judgment of acquittal, the trial court must proceed with the new trial unless the appellate court orders otherwise. See, now we're getting into the appeal processing. And that's what I understand more than all this other he say, she say type thing. B, denial of a motion for a new trial. If the court conditionally denies a motion for a new trial, an appellee may assert that the denial was erroneous. If the appellate court later reverses the judgment of acquittal, the trial court must proceed as the appellate court directs. So I just wanted to share with you that there are ways that, you know, all of the prosecutions, immunities and all of the, you know, miscommunication on dates and times and places and spaces. And if he entered from the back or if he entered from the front, all of that is going to be looked at by jury and jury will be able, based upon Bonjean's, you know, motion to put an acquittal on the table they do have the right, the jury has the right to listen and hear um, according with the judge. They're going to diverse, you know, based on what they saw in the uh, in the in the, the videos. And they're going to say, you know, what they feel. Should it be acquitted? Should it be let go? Because there wasn't enough evidence on the table for prosecution because prosecution has given all that they can give and to refuse to even allow another person even testify. So I don't know if it was because they had a certain time limit, a time restraint, or if the information wasn't put out as effectively as they thought it would be based on, you know, just the conversation. And also cruel. You know, we have to listen to that conversation. There was a lot of that stuff left out that was sealed and unable to be heard by the jury. It was more than that. Asa Krul did a lot to entice Jane for her testimony. And all of these immunity situations that's going on in this case, you better believe, you better know and believe that there's going to be something to answer to because Bonjean is just not going to let that go because she has that right to that appeal and she's going to definitely take it. You already see she's taking it in the acquittal process. So I just wanted to leave that with you to leave that on your hearts so you can meditate on it tonight. Give me your point of view. I'm going to put 10 minutes into the chat for you to say whatever you would like to say. Um, and then we will, I will have all the notes for tomorrow's, you know, uh, premiere. I'll be on. Probably not a lot going to happen tomorrow because, you know, they're still wait, waiting on the Rule 29. And, um, yeah. So I hope everybody's okay. Um, someone mentioned, let me see here. Let me see. 
You know what's amazing? It's my twin's birthday today. <laughs> now, rule 33 is about a new trial. <laughs> now, according to the Law Cornell, uh, Law Cornell Review, a defendant's motion upon defendant's motion, the court may vacate any judgment and grant a new trial if the interest of justice so requires. If the case was tried without a jury, the court may take additional testimony and enter a new judgment. B, time to file. One, newly discovered evidence. If there's any motion for a new trial grounded or newly discovered evidence must be filed within three years after the verdict or finding of guilty. Um... If an appeal is pending, the court may not grant a motion for a new trial until the appellate court remands the case. Now, I'm not sure if this is based on the federal Brooklyn appeal that's happening right now um, or if this is specific to Chicago. So we will look into that. Other grounds, any motion for a new trial grounded on any reason other than newly discovered evidence must be filed within 14 days after the verdict or finding of guilt. Notes to the advisory committee. The, rules in, the rule enlarges the time limit for motions for new trial on the ground of newly discovered evidence from 60 days to two years. And for motions for new trial on other grounds from three to five days. Otherwise, it substantially continues existing practice. See Rule 2 of the Criminal Appeals, Rules of 1933, 292 U.S. 661, and Rule 59A of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, so we'll, we'll start looking into the appeal processing of this because there's a lot of things that's going on. And as I was sharing with my clients today, you know, my students are looking at ways that the judicial system is using Robert Sylvester Kelly as a public opinion case that um, could grant him based upon precedent law. It could be motivated um, by the appeal process because we're backing up information with other uh, preceding law, law that reflects what has taken place in the trial courts, both federally Brooklyn, federally Chicago. So I want to keep you guys posted on that. I will definitely do that. I thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. Um, every one of you are very, very valued and welcomed here. Um, I will go over here to see if anyone has said anything on yesterday's Let me see on yesterday's. Let me see. Yeah, it's really it's just all free R Kelly. Free R Kelly. Yes, yes, yes. So that's very important. Very important. Some people say they're doing them like they did Bill Cosby. Free R. Kelly. The government mentioned R. Kelly's case in court, which they wasn't supposed to, but wanted to keep the witnesses undercover. Hopefully the jury uses common sense that it's been a bunch of lies. Yeah. So that's what we have. So I've already been on today. I've done my part. I love you all. And we'll see you next time.